The prelude in C major of Johann Sebastian Bach is the first in a collection of 24 preludes and fugues which he wrote, one in every major and minor key. Bach was the very first composer to do this, and this piece is the very first piece, it's the very opening of that very monumental cycle of pieces. Bach wrote, as I mentioned, 24 preludes and fugues, and later he wrote a second volume, so altogether there are 48 preludes and fugues, two in every major and minor key. Quite an amazing achievement. One of the first things to notice about this piece is that it's not just purely a chain of 16th notes. We have three separate voices. We have the half notes down below, which are held. We have, after the 16th rest, we have these middle notes, which are also held down. And then up above, we have the third voice, the individual 16th notes. What that means, practically speaking, is that we hold the first two notes down, but the, the rest of the notes we play individually. Hold these ones down, and these ones are played individually. This is very typical, by the way, for Baroque music, the idea of writing multiple melodies or thinking in terms of multiple voices. This is what we call polyphonic music. Um, we don't really have a melody and accompaniment like we have in classical music, but we have multiple melodies that work together to create the total uh, music that we hear. One of the things you might be wondering about in this piece is, should I use pedal? And if so, where and how much? Well, one of the first things to think about is that this instrument would not have been written for the modern piano with a sustained pedal, but for most likely the harpsichord, which is a predecessor of the piano. It's what Bach often played on, and it is an instrument without any capability of sustaining the notes via a pedal. There was no sustained pedal on the harpsichord. So that means Bach was certainly not thinking of pedal when he wrote this piece because he didn't have one. That means as well that it's certainly possible and indeed historically accurate to play it without pedal. However, the other side of the argument is if Bach had had access to a modern piano, he most likely would have taken advantage of everything that that instrument had to offer, and he very likely would have used the pedal on a piece like this. Of course, we can't know for certain. What we can, however, say is that it's a piece that lends itself very well to using pedal. So um, many, many pianists would play this with pedal, including me. I think if I were performing it, I would use pedal, perhaps depending a bit on the acoustics of the hall, but that's another issue. At any rate, as you watch me playing this piece, you'll notice that I lift the pedal up essentially every measure. You don't have to lift it up twice every measure because we have the same notes repeated. At the beginning, I just repeat, so they're not going to get blurred together. I don't have to worry about that. But when I get to the new harmony at the second measure, as soon as I play that first note in the measure, I lift the pedal up and then put it back down again. Lift the pedal up and put it back down again. And basically continue like this throughout the piece. That will give the piece some warmth and some ambiance. And as I mentioned, it depends perhaps a bit on, on, on the hall, the location with your, where you're playing. If you have a hall with lots of reverb, maybe you don't need the pedal. If it's a more uh, dry sort of sound, uh, a little pedal can help to warm up the uh, acoustics. Let's talk a bit about dynamics in this piece as well. Another thing to know about the harpsichord for which this piece would have been written is that it was not capable of playing loud and soft in the way that we do on the modern piano. No matter how hard or soft you hit the keys on the harpsichord, they respond in exactly the same way, with exactly the same loudness. Um, now again, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do anything on the modern piano, it just means that's the starting point that we have to think about uh, in terms of the instrument for which this piece was written. Most musicians assume that if Bach had had access to a modern piano, he would have taken advantage of everything that it had to offer. That means that, of course, on the piano, on the modern piano, um, it's perfectly acceptable to do some dynamic shading. And I think it, it's uh, on the modern piano actually necessary to make this piece sound interesting. Otherwise, as you notice, the writing is very homogenous. We have lots of 16th notes. The, the writing stays 
more or less the same in terms of the rhythm and the structure of the music. Uh, we don't have a lot of contrast there. It needs some sense of shape and so forth, which uh, we can create through some dynamic differences in this piece. Let the harmony be your guide and let the sense of the musical line be your guide. There are many things that a person could do, but I'll give you just a, a couple brief ideas. Now we start out, for example, the harmony gets a little more intense without even having to analyze what chords we're playing, we can feel that the harmony is getting a bit more intense. Here also, and we feel the resolution back to C, which means we can play a little softer there. And now, listen to this, suddenly a minor sort of sound, a minor chord here, and the melody is higher than it was before, the top note, so that might be a place to let the music grow, make a crescendo, play more strongly. And now going back down again. And back up. And so forth. And that will help give it a little bit of shape. Occasionally, and you don't want to do this too often, you can maybe delay the start of the uh, measure and play with a little bit of rubato. For example, um, that was a bit too much. But that sort of idea, if you want to divide the music up into phrases, um, you, can, you can create just a little bit of rubato between those measures. One thing to think about is that as we get further into the piece, we get some harmonies that are more intense and more dissonant. These ones, for example. That's a place where you could really start to create a strong crescendo because when we have a sense of dissonance, we want the music to, we, we want to feel this tension in the music and when it resolves and comes back to our more normal harmonies, we can release that tension. Um, at the end of the piece, I'd like to discuss just the last three measures because many people find this difficult. If you look at the um, right hand here, One thing to notice if you have a little bit of a background in harmony, and this is something we talk about elsewhere in the course, these notes all belong to the F major chord. The only exception is the D at the end. So if you think in terms of F major, it makes those notes a lot easier to find. One thing to think about is that with the fingering, I can keep it very simple here. I don't have to do anything in my hand until I get to this note, to the A, and there I use my fourth finger. Okay, so just staying in the same spot, same hand position, same hand position, switching to the fourth finger, four, two, one. Similar thing here in the next measure. Up until there, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to move my hand at all. Now I put the fifth finger on the B and the very last chord, typical in Baroque music, I can roll, play the notes one after, another, one after the next, like this. So those are the most important things in playing the Bach prelude in C major. Hope you enjoyed this piece. It's a lovely, lovely work, beautiful music, and I'll see you in the next piece.